Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Jewish History. My name is Joel Levy. I'm the president of the center, and I'm so pleased to see so many people here this evening for what should be a wonderful, wonderful time that we will all have. I'd like to, for those who are new to the center, who don't know the institution, just to say a word. It is a partnership of five different organizations the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and Yibo Institute for Jewish Research, all of which have archives, and the archives come together and reside in this building. The center processes those archives and makes them accessible to scholars and all interested people. And collectively, the collections which belong to the partners comprise about 100 million documents, making this the largest archive of its kind in the world. And it is a major center for scholarship on modern Jewish history, modern being only the last 1,000 years. <laughs> so all things are relative. Uh, we're particularly pleased that the occasion for this evening's lecture which is one in a series of four related to the magnificent exhibition that we have of some wonderful, wonderful things from Corpus Christi College in Oxford. And it's in partnership between Corpus Christi College, Yeshiva University Museum, and the center itself that we're able to have this exhibition. So it's a great, great pleasure. And I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend David Block, who represents Corpus Christi this evening, who will in turn introduce the speaker. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. With our colleagues at the Center for Jewish History and Yeshiva University Museum, we're delighted to offer this evening's event. Before we proceed, I hope you'll indulge me as I tell you briefly about Corpus Christi College one of the 38 self-governing colleges at the modern University of Oxford. In March, Corpus celebrated its 500th anniversary. This was a celebration not simply of longevity, but of something more powerful, its special place in the story of higher learning. In fact, Corpus was the first Renaissance institution in Oxford, where it pioneered humanism, a radical departure in intellectual life. Notwithstanding its name, it was and is a secular college. Its founder, Bishop Richard Fox, a chief advisor to Henry VIII, used his considerable wealth and influence to secure a great educational legacy. When he established Corpus, he installed John Clayman, a committed humanist, as its first president. Together, they fostered ambitious standards of scholarly inquiry across a range of then revolutionary subjects medicine, mathematics, astronomy, and no less significant, Greek and Hebrew. The college became an unsurpassed center of classical and scriptural study, thanks in part to its remarkable library. Among other achievements, it took the lead in the enterprise that resulted in the King James Bible, for it was John Reynolds, the seventh president of Corpus, who proposed to the king that there be an authorized translation and used Corpus's Hebrew manuscripts, some of which are on display here, uh, for his committee's rendering of the prophets. The Corpus treasures on display at Yeshiva have been seen by the public for the first time in America and in many cases anywhere. They are normally kept in a vault, invisible to the world and barely accessible to scholars. They deserve better. That is why we have mounted this show in partnership with our colleagues not simply to celebrate these works of genius and the role of Hebrew and Jewish learning in the foundation of the college, but to let you know about our campaign to build a permanent home for them, one that will exhibit, digitize, and store these texts and conditions, ensuring their survival, and actually allowing them to be studied. We ask for your help, and I invite you to speak with me after our talk if you have ideas. But enough with the pitch. While Corpus's treasures are testimony to its early roots, today it is a modern institution dedicated to the essential task of testing all claims to truth against facts and the application of reason. Perhaps no Corpus alumnus advanced this mission more than Isaiah Berlin, one of the 20th century's foremost political philosophers, whose seminal essay, Two Concepts of Liberty, 
remains a starting point for discussions of the meaning and value of political freedom. This gives me the perfect transition to introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, Roger Cohen. As you probably know, Roger has worked for the New York Times for 27 years as a foreign correspondent, foreign editor, and now columnist. Prior to that, he worked for our media partner, The Wall Street Journal, and for Reuters. He is the author of four books, the latest of which is a family memoir entitled The Girl from Human Street, Ghosts of Memory in a Jewish Family. Roger has taught at Harvard and Princeton, upstarts by Oxford standards, I guess. And his work has been recognized with a Lifetime Achievement Award from Britain's New Century Foundation and a prize from the Overseas Press Club of New York. Raised in South Africa and England, he is a naturalized American and, I note, a graduate of Balliol College, Oxford, but we forgive him that. I want to thank Roger for making himself available tonight and for being so receptive to the cold email I sent him more than a year ago when I noticed how many of his columns focused on the issues of pluralism that so animated Berlin. These issues have, of course, become more urgent. I also want to thank everyone at CJH and Yeshiva, in particular Joel Levy, Jacob Weiss, and Miriam Heyer, for their commitment and, insist and assistance in making this evening and the exhibition a success. And now please join me in welcoming Roger as he discusses Liberty and Facts, Isaiah Berlin in the Age of Trump. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, there have been a few zigzags uh, before I got here tonight, and I want to thank uh, David uh, particularly uh, for his patience. Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, I should mention, as David already has right at the outset, that I am not a corpuscle. Uh, I recently learned, in fact, a few minutes ago, that a corpuscle is the name for a corpus uh, graduate. Um, I am, as David mentioned, a Balliol man. Uh, I can safely say that we were better at football, or soccer if you insist, at least in the mid-1970s. For the rest, I'm prepared to keep an open mind. Um, open minds are, after all, what we are here to celebrate and uphold. I should also say um, that I am a Jew uh, of Lithuanian descent, raised in South Africa and Britain, and now a naturalized American. Like Isaiah Berlin, to use a term that has become almost quaint, I am an emigre who carries in his bones the knowledge that for my family to stay on in the Baltic states would have meant certain death nameless in the forest. Nothing is so guaranteed to induce queasiness in the emigre as bigoted nationalism. It's a recurrent puzzle. The blood-dimmed tide returns. Now, as a naturalized American, I took an oath. And the oath was to support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I like to think, especially now, that I do that in some small way, twice a week, in my columns in the New York Times. This oath to defend the Constitution is a very beautiful and very subtle concept. It's at the heart of the American idea. And America, at least in my view, is an idea, or it's nothing. That we are a nation of laws, that all Americans, whatever their beliefs or faiths or color, have the same rights and responsibilities under the law. And that this law establishes checks and balances designed to do a number of things, safeguard our freedom, our democracy, and our openness, allow us to correct our mistakes, for we do make them, and empower us to carry out into the world our values in the belief that if they cannot always deliver the best, they may at least avert the worst. Now the president's oath too is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It is an oath to the law, not to the folk. President Trump got it wrong in his inaugural speech when he said, 
The oath of office I take today is an oath of allegiance to all Americans. No, sir, it is not. We know where volkish allegiance can lead. This is a time for vigilance. It's a time to pay close attention to the law, which is synonymous with our republic. Now, to say that Isaiah Berlin would be appalled by the discourse, or perhaps I should say the incoherent, mendacious babble of Donald Trump's America, is to state the obvious. He would not, however, have been incredulous Berlin had a very healthy regard for humankind's capacity for stupidity, madness, irrationality, ignorance, militarization, and subordination. He would, incidentally, have felt vindicated in one regard, at least, by Donald Trump's apotheosis, having written of Washington, D.C. in 1943 that, quote, no town has ever taken itself so seriously with so little reason. Now, Berlin saw an advanced civilization, Germany, descend into bestial violence and take much of Europe with it. He saw an educated people seduced by a buffoon. He saw the Jews of Europe, his Europe, his fellow Jews, ushered to the gas or, in his native Latvia, assembled on the edge of town and shot dead. He was in a very real sense, a pessimist. No light was immune to darkness, no high culture impervious to barbarism. His political philosophy took form around the conviction that avoidance, or at least containment, of the worst in human nature was as worthy and far less dangerous a goal than the pursuit of some illusory perfection. In The Crooked Timber of Humanity, Berlin wrote, a liberal sermon re which recommends machinery designed to prevent people from doing each other too much harm, giving each human group sufficient room to realize its own idiosyncratic, unique, particular ends without too much interference with the ends of others, is not a passionate battle cry to inspire men to sacrifice and martyrdom and heroic feats. Still, for Berlin, that machinery was essential because no perfect solution is, not merely in practice, but in principle, possible in human affairs. And any attempt to produce it is likely to lead to suffering, disillusionment, and failure. The backdrop to those words of Isaiah Berlin was, of course, the rise of murderous utopian political ideology in the first half of the 20th century. In the bloodlands, to use Timothy Snyder's phrase for the killing fields of Central and Eastern Europe, fascism and communism collided. That they first embraced in the secret Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and then fought each other suggests a fratricidal attraction and loathing. The extreme right and the extreme left as we note even today, are always uneasy cousins at play in the same schoolyard. Each ideology posited in the thousand-year Reich and a classless paradise, the perfectibility of society. Each was prepared in the gulag and the concentrationslager, orchestrated Ukrainian famine and Auschwitz to slaughter on a massive scale in pursuit of its objective. Tens of millions died in the deathly web of their silencing certitudes. Fascism and communism were not the same, of course, and I'm not gonna pass here the Olympics of suffering. What interests me is that these were revolutionary ideologies that engendered mass movements backed by organizations with the command of force. The Bolshevik Revolution uprooted Isaiah Berlin in the physical sense, lifting him in time from Riga to Corpus Christi College, Oxford. Totalitarianism shaped him in the ideological sense. The road from Europe's double suicide in 1914 and 1939 to Berlin's concept of liberty is not a meandering one. He knew what liberty for the wolves meant for the lambs. Liberal society was an exercise then 
in the balancing of multiple freedoms. As Berlin famously wrote, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. To force people into the neat uniforms demanded by dogmatically believed in schemes is almost always the road to inhumanity. Now, ideologies in the 20th century sense have largely disappeared in the 21st century, unless you count jihadism, which is really a form of pre-enlightenment religious fanaticism. I will get to that a bit later. So if the danger is past, if we live essentially in a post-ideological world, why would Trumpism, forgive me for even using the term, have concerned Isaiah Berlin? Well, first let me try to define Trumpism. My title is Liberty and Facts, Isaiah Berlin and in the Age of Trump. Liberty depends on facts. When the distinction between truth and lies disappears, there is no basis for rational discourse on which the organization of a free society depends. Without facts, disorientation propagates itself. This serves an autocratic leader. Disoriented people are more inclined to accept a despot as the sole font of truth. Now, Trumpism is an exercise in distraction from or denial of facts. It is the fear exploiting assemblage of an alternative reality, a form of collective gaslighting at Twitter speed. It's founded on the president's intuitive sense of how media, and he has very powerful intuitions, intuitive sense of how media and so social media function today as limiters of attention spans. And it seeks to achieve dominance through a whirlwind of individually meaningless but cumulatively manipulative statements. At its very core lies arbitrariness. Trump functions still within our democratic institutions, but with a personal court, composed in part, quite largely, of his family, rather than the demarcated areas of responsibility that go with a traditional and accountable form of bureaucracy. Unpredictability is raised to a governing principle. Trump also exhibits an exquisite understanding of humankind's susceptibility to the despot's authority. A lesson learned, I think, through his command over a decade of huge TV audiences in a show that built toward a frisson of cruelty, delivered with the laconic phrase, you're fired. Adrenaline is all. Trump understands that today, velocity trumps veracity. A perfect state of affairs, one might say, for the manic personality. Consider, for example, this presidential statement from Donald Trump. I mean, had Andrew Jackson been a little later, you wouldn't have had the Civil War. He was a very tough person, but he had a big heart. And he was really angry that he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War. He said, there's no reason for this. People don't realize, you know, the Civil War. If you think about it, why? People don't ask that question. But why was there the Civil War? Why could that one not have been worked out? Well, what to say? What to say? That Jackson was dead 16 years when the Civil War began? That therefore he did not see what was happening or say there's no reason for this? And yeah, if you think about it, why? Well, how to begin to answer that, Mr. President? Perhaps, perhaps we might cite slavery, for example, <laughs> as central to the Civil War's causation. And yes, why indeed could that one not have been worked out? Well, slavery's legacy is still being worked out. This, you see, is precisely what President Trump wants us to do. Waste time dissecting unfathomable statement X when he's already moved on to outburst Y. I plead guilty. 
Then, of course, there are Donald Trump's words in the guest book after his recent visit in Israel to the Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem. Here is what he wrote. It's a great honor to be here with all of my friends. So amazing, and we'll never forget. There we have it, the unbearable lightness of being Donald Trump. So amazing, I will say no more. Remember the special prosecutor he promised to investigate Hillary Clinton? Remember the Syrian safe zones he promised for refugees? Remember the three million immigrants he's going to force out the country or carcerate? His imperative is noise, noise. What follows matters rather less. Now, there are many things that concern me about the Trump presidency. In fact, there are few that don't. But the fri frivolous blurring of truth and untruth, fact and falsehood, falsehood, is the most grave. Speed and disruption have more psychological impact than truth and science, which is what was important to Isaiah Berlin. The debunking of a fake news story is seldom as powerful as the story itself. People begin to wonder, am I imagining this? They feel that some infernal mechanism is at work and is dragging them toward some abyss. The president, after all, ladies and gentlemen, is a reference point. If he lies, lying seeps into our culture. Americans start to wonder, maybe as they go to sleep at night, or when they wake up and look at some tweet, because there's always a tweet in the early morning, will we be able to dislodge these people from power? As Simon Sharma, the British historian, recently observed, indifference about the distinction between truth and lies is the precondition of fascism. When truth perishes, so does freedom. Now, I was at Indiana University over the past semester, uh, and I was doing some teaching there. And I was talking a lot about the media, about fake news, about the failing New York Times, um, about how to keep one's bearings in today's media environment. And I talked about um, the inclination of the president uh, to say things that are false, that are untrue. And a student got up, um, and this is in Bloomington, which is uh, kind of a blue island in, in, in the Red Sea of, of Indiana. Uh, and he said to me, Mr. Cohen, I disagree with you. I said, why? He said, well, there's no question that President Trump is the most honest president we've ever had. And I said to this young man, well, why do you think that? And he said, well, unlike any other president we've had, he's doing exactly what he said he would do. He's the most honest president we've ever had. I said, well, yes, I suppose you could argue that. But he's also saying things that are demonstrably untrue all the time on a regular basis. He said, no. He is the most honest president we've ever had. And I think the most worrying thing in America today is the absence, as that little exchange perhaps illustrates, of any foundation for debate. There are no common facts. There is no viable vocabulary, it seems. There is no shared reality. So how do we, as Americans, learn again to talk to each other. Now, I believe all this would have worried Isaiah Berlin deeply. To see an uncurious, irrational, and ahistorical man, completely ahistorical, no interest in, let alone knowledge of, history, occupying the most powerful office on earth would have alarmed him, would have alarmed him. Berlin was always aware of what he called the forces of anti-rational, mystical bigotry. He knew that these forces could not be eliminated, even if perhaps he could not have imagined how technology and handheld devices would turbocharge these forces, drive us into rival ideological canyons, and open the way for Donald Trump. America is riven today. This is the situation, ladies and gentlemen, to which Fox News, Republican debunking of reason and science, herd reinforcing social media algorithms, liberal arrogance, rightist bigotry, and an economy of growing inequality have ushered us. It's perhaps the most important problem confronting the United States because the end point of hardening fracture and mutual incomprehension is what? 
It's violence, like the recent fatal stabbing of two men by a Muslim insulting white supremacist on a Portland commuter train, or the shooting of Republican congressmen in Washington, D.C. And I hear, as all this happens, Isaiah Berlin reminding us of a truth of which the founding fathers were mindful. The best that one can do is try to promote some kind of equilibrium, necessarily unstable, between the different aspirations of different groups of human beings. That's not sexy. It is, however, an essential liberal admonition. Benjamin Franklin asked in Philadelphia in 1787 what form of governance had been agreed upon, famously responded, a republic, if you can keep it. I think that seldom in the ensuing 230 years has the keeping required as much watchfulness as is demanded now. Trumpism may have no societal purpose other than the worship of its namesake, but it is no less dangerous for that. Now, when I covered the war in Bosnia, um, I met a man named Enver Imanovic, who was the director of the National Museum in Sarajevo. And it was he who rescued the Sarajevo Haggadah during the war as fierce fighting rage. And it was to me an act worthy of a remarkable city, a Muslim saving a Jewish manuscript stored in an old Viennese safe in the basement of a museum built by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and under attack from Serb nationalists bent on destroying the mingling of culture and religions that had long marked Sarajevo. A city of mingling, Sarajevo, just like Aleppo before its destruction. And this was an act, Imamovic's, of deep civility. And I was reminded of this as I thought about this occasion and Isaiah Berlin, a Jew from Riga, studying at Corpus Christi, a college founded five centuries earlier at a time when the Jews were still banned from Britain by a bishop, Richard Fox, with a deep interest in Hebrew, a college that, in this spirit, built up under its early presidents an unparalleled trilingual library of books in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And these are the remarkable treasures that are on display now right here. And that today holds what has been called perhaps the most important collection of Anglo-Jewish manuscripts in the world. I can do no better here than quote David, the corpus graduate, corpuscle, who kindly overlooked my Balliol pedigree and invited me, on the scope of this collection, held until now, like the Sarajevo Haggadah, in a basement. They include the famous commentaries of the French Rabbi Rashi, texts created jointly by Jews and Christians in medieval England to provide instruction in translating passages from the Hebrew Bible, and most striking of all, an Ashkenazi prayer book owned by a Sephardic Jew from southern Spain. Dating from the 12th century, it is thought to be the oldest surviving Jewish prayer book of European origin. So in Isaiah Berlin, we find a Jew from a part of Europe where Jewishness would be extinguished by the Nazis, studying at a college founded by a Christian in a country, England, from which the Jews were banished for centuries, but eventually returned. Jews whose century-old books and wisdom were safeguarded in a library and whose existence was refracted through the brilliance of this singular student, a young man who came to be obsessed by the viable architecture of liberal tolerance. I find this moving. I find it particularly moving and relevant at a time when liberal tolerance, coexistence and civilized disagreement are under attack from the forces of nativism and nationalism. Jews know from our history where this can lead. Yet to these forces, President Trump has given more than a wink of connivance. This is the other aspect of Trumpism that demands our attention, for he has facilitated the release of everybody's inner bigot. For him, telling it like it is has often meant telling how dangerous he thinks Muslims are. The ugly list is long, the proposed Muslim ban during the campaign, the gratuitous attack, gratuitous attack on Kizar Khan 
the father of a fallen Muslim officer. The reckless travel ban, always in caps, that raises issues of due process and religious discrimination. The totally, totally unjustifiable criticism of Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. He just wanted to insult a prominent Muslim, it seems, after the recent terrorist attack on Tower Bridge. That Donald Trump is anti-Muslim seems to me pretty obvious. The way to defeat jihadism, a savage anti-Western ideology involving a warped Wahhabi medievalist reading of the Quran as a call to restore a caliphate, is not, is not, to impugn an entire religion of 1.6 billion people. Nor, I think, is it to opt for an uncritical embrace of Saudi Arabia, the home of Wahhabism. Dancing with swords is not really the way to go. Now, ISIS represents undiluted evil. It must be extirpated, Raqqa retaken. We have an enemy. But bigotry is not the way to fight it. Trump, like other illiberal leaders, preys on the fears of our age. They are multiple. I do not believe the president is an anti-Semite, but he's been advised that there are enough anti-Semites on the fringes of his movement to make occasional gestures toward them a paying political proposition. The cosmopolitan financiers invoked during the campaign the weird Holocaust Memorial Day statement from the White House that didn't even mention the Jews, the humiliation of an Orthodox Jewish reporter at a press conference, whereupon, I think, every single reporter in that room should have walked out. All of this is dangerous. It's dangerous. It's the obverse of what I will call the spirit of corpus and of Isaiah Berlin's ecumenism and liberalism. To Berlin's two concepts of liberty, Trump opposes one concept of self-exaltation. He has trampled on the Constitution. He has attacked the freedom of the press enshrined in the First Amendment, calling us enemies of the people, a phrase of pure totalitarian pedigree used by Stalin, used by Mao, used by all of them. And he has attacked the independence of the judiciary, Serious questions exist as to whether aid or comfort was given by the Trump entourage to an American enemy, in this case, Russia. A special counsel, Robert Mueller, is now investigating that. The battle to keep our republic has been engaged. Now, looking back at human history, the liberal democratic experiment, with its enlightenment-derived belief in the capacity of individuals possessed of certain inalienable rights to shape their destinies in liberty through the exercise of their will, is really but a brief interlude. Far more lasting have been the eras in fallible sovereignty, absolute power derived from God, domination, and serfdom. But the democratic idea is also stubborn. Technology has prized the world open. Nobody. Not Putin, not Xi, not Erdogan, not Hamenei, not even President Trump can arrest that development, that interconnectedness. Nor can anybody quash forever the human desire to be free and to live under the only form of government consistent with that desire, representative government installed with the consent of the people and working for the people. Liberalism demands what? It demands acceptance of our human differences and the ability to mediate them through democratic institutions. It demands acceptance of multiple, even perhaps incompatible truths. And Berlin never tired of saying this, of insisting on this. In an age of declamation and shouting, of polarization and vilification, this may seem a lofty aspiration. But democracies have a habit of rising to the challenge they face, as Winston Churchill demonstrated in defeating Hitler before he was chased from office in the election of 1945. Talk about gratitude. <laughs> democracies need to be challenged, unlike dictatorships that fear broad challenge because it may cause them to buckle or snap. We need to be challenged, ladies and gentlemen. We need right now to think again. The post-Cold War is over. Another is being born before our eyes. Challenge in democracies is also reinvention. 
and rebirth. My instinct is to respect the intelligence of voters. Sooner or later, they do come to their senses, as do the societies that have driven them to anger. Churchill was re-elected in 1951. It's important, even in this polarized situation I've described, to hear people out. That's democracy, listening to what people say. There are hateful racists among Trump supporters. There are also many decent, thoughtful, anxious, patriotic Americans who felt they were losing some part of their country's essence. The liberal complacency that holds that these people simply need to be educated is, I think, self-defeating. If that's what the Democratic Party exudes, coastal complacency, it will lose, just like Hillary Clinton did last year. As Abe Streep, a journalist in Montana, put it to me, nobody's ever been convinced by being made to feel stupid. But listening is not acquiescence. Trumpism, as currently practiced, is, I believe, a betrayal of who we are. And we must stand up for the Constitution and for everything that is noble in the American idea. Americans are fighting back. We are not going down the rabbit hole where two plus two equals five and lies are truth and vice versa. We are not, we are not going through that looking glass. We are fighting back through the courts, blocking the travel ban. There are petitions, there are protests. The press has been reborn. The New York Times and the Washington Post are going mano a mano on the greatest story perhaps since Watergate. We have 305,000 new subscribers at the New York Times in the first quarter. We're certainly not, thank you. We're certainly not the failing New York Times. All those millennials who thought that information was free, that information would forever be free, are waking up to the fact that a strong press, a press that holds power to account, a press that bears witness is essential, essential to the functioning of democracy. And if you want strong investigative journalism, if you want groups of reporters to spend weeks, months on a major story looking into the links between the Trump campaign and Russia, or what exactly Mike Flynn got up to and who paid him and why, then it's worth paying nine bucks a month or 14 bucks a month. People are realizing this, they are realizing the importance, the vital importance of the First Amendment and the press. And Steve Bannon, of course, suggested that all we journalists shut up. Well, no, Mr. Bannon, we're not going to shut up. In fact, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to be remorseless in trying to get to the bottom of what is going on within the Trump administration and what happened during this campaign. That was a campaign infiltrated, as we now know, uh, by the Russians. Yet this infiltration, this subversion of our democracy apparently holds zero interest, zero interest, none whatsoever, not a phrase, zero interest for the President of the United States. Think about it. Our democracy is subverted and the President is uninterested. Well, what does that say? There must be a reason why he's uninterested. It's a bizarre thing, don't you think? We need to get to the bottom of it. And for that, we will need the courts. We will need the special counsel. We will need the press. We will need people writing to their congressmen, their representatives. We will need an American society that is vigilant about keeping our republic. And I think at this point, President Trump must wake up every morning and wonder what Mr. Mueller is doing. The president was unbound as a real estate developer in Queens and then Manhattan. He'd shut the door, closet himself with a lawyer and his members of his family and decide if the law got in the way, he would try to circumvent it. I think he wants to continue or wanted to continue in the same vein. But in his way, obstructing him, he's finding what I just talked about, the law, the press, popular protests, the Democratic Party and more. That's the battle, I think, unfolding before our eyes. Trump versus the Founding Fathers, the court of King Donald against the Enlightenment. As Saul Bellow observed in Humboldt's Gift, great novel, the United States is a big operation, very big. It's bigger than this little man. 
checks and balances do still work. And it's exhilarating to see how the liberal ideas that were so memorably embraced by Isaiah Berlin and were set down almost 250 years ago can be effective in countering Trump. I'll say in conclusion um, that I, I am an optimist. I mentioned that my parents hailed from South Africa. Um, they were Jewish immigrants in Britain. Uh, I spent my infancy in South Africa and quite a large part of my childhood going back and forth. And so I grew up not only understanding racism like a microbe in the blood, I absorbed it, saw it, felt it, like a kind of osmosis. I was always in the wrong place. I was trying to puzzle out why all the blacks were swimming in the filthy harbor at Cork Bay, and yet the miles and miles of golden sand at Musenberg Beach, where we would go, uh, were only frequented by whites. What, what was happening? Why, why, why was it like this? And, and, and I grew up with this, um, you know, the catastrophe, the cataclysm w was always coming. It, it was going to come. It was inevitable. The tens of millions of blacks banished to the horizon, to the filthy townships under the cruel, inhuman system of apartheid, would rise up and claim what was theirs. And the white families, four million or so whites, perched tenuously um, in Johannesburg and on the high ridge of the Transvaal uh, would be chased out. And I remember my cousins every year saying to me, enjoy the swimming pools. This was in uh, Houghton, a very nice neighborhood of Johannesburg. Enjoy the swimming pools, Roger. Next year, they'll be red with blood. Well, you know what? It didn't happen. And uh, why didn't it happen? Because Nelson Mandela and de Klerk decided to do something very brave, especially in Mandela's case, uh, to place the future over the past. That is always essential when you're trying to end conflict, placing the future over the past, essential in the Balkans, essential in Israel-Palestine. But it's the most difficult thing to do because it means placing your children above past grievance, past wounds. And that is what they did. And one of my favorite poems um, is by the Israeli poet Yehuda Amikai, uh, The Tourists. And as you may know, it's about a group of tourists with a guide uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, he's pointing to an arch of the Roman period. Uh, and he's using uh, a man who is sitting there with his shopping as a reference point saying uh, the Roman arch is, is just to the right uh, of this person. And Amica writes, not precisely this, but this is the sense of it, that redemption will only come when instead the guide says there's a Roman arch. It's not important. But next to it, there sits a man who's bought fruit and vegetables for his family. In other words, glorious as the past may be, putting food on the table for your children is more important. And that's what Mandela and de Klerk did. And what they also did, and I think this is where we must begin in any endeavor, is what they did was to embrace our common humanity, our common shared humanity, not deny it, which is what nationalism and bigotry and the blood dim tide, Yeats's phrase, do. And I think Isaiah Berlin put that necessity very well, really an admonition to all of us, particularly at this juncture in history. Berlin wrote, all forms of tampering with human beings, getting at them, shaping them against their will to your own pattern, all thought control and conditioning is therefore a denial of that in men which makes them men and their values ultimate. Thank you very much.
Well, I'd be happy to take a question or two if any of you have one. Yes, sir. Do we have a mic? Or? <laughs> but in reference to your point about Trump and our tax, the one reason why we could actually have this discussion is because there were no taxes. In fact, there was that. You were speculating. I would say, I don't think Russia's going to do this, so why would they put so much money into it? And he would say, well, you know, New York has a business regulation for doing this, but we don't want Russia to actually follow that up with, you know, maybe a cigarette or tax. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you can comment on the fact that we have always actually argued without having a tax, and that is one of the very elements. Right. Did, did you all hear that? Uh, uh, well, the question was about a discussion between this gentleman, who I believe is of liberal inclination, with a Republican in the 1980s. And they were talking about Russia, and they had different views on Russia. And, and he was saying that even then, there weren't really facts that they could base their discussion on. They were, they were making informed guesses about what the real situation in in Russia is and, and about, about their conviction. So the question is, you know, have things really changed? Um, well, I think they have. I think it's become the most venomous um, differences in the United States today are between uh, the supporters of Donald Trump and the opponents of Donald Trump. There is, it seems to me often, a complete incapacity to even begin to have uh, the kind of discussion that you just described, sir. And I think, whereas in the 80s, um, many Americans, perhaps most Americans, were more or less watching the same news shows and were able to share certain references, today um, we are channeled by all kinds of means uh, into the ideological canyons where we are comforted in, in what we already believe. I was recently in Telluride at a documentary movie festival, um, and uh, I was speaking to a woman from rural Minnesota who runs a movie festival in rural Minnesota. And her father is an ardent Trump supporter. And Telluride, as you may know, is, is a pretty liberal town. And she told me how, because she had brought her eight-year-old son with her to Telluride, he had said to her, oh, I see you want to get in some early terrorist training for your son. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of thing, um, he's a realtor in Minnesota. Uh, th th I think, you know, I think so that, you know, although facts were disputed, have always been disputed, today, I often don't see any foundation whatsoever uh, with which to begin a discussion. I mean, I, I cited the example of the student who thinks that Donald Trump is the most honest president we've ever had. And I think there are 35 to 40 percent of Americans still, even today, who might be sympathetic to that view. I think to many of us, it's evident that truthfulness is not something that the president cares about at all. So um, I do think things have changed and that we've reached um, a degree of separation um, that is very troubling. I mean, the last time, I think it's partly because there are no fora anymore into which Americans are thrown together, uh, or it's become increasingly rare. The last time I recall it was when I was on jury duty. And when I began the jury duty, I listened to what some of my fellow jurors said, and I thought, are they even listening to the same thing I'm listening to? And I thought we would never, ever uh, reach um, agreement. And, you know, after a week, 10 days together, 
Uh, we did, and that's what happens when you, and I recently I wrote a column a couple of months ago, the column got zero traction, asking whether it might not be a good thing to revive some kind of civilian national service. Uh, so the question in the country became not where did you study, but where did you do your service? And could be working on inner cities or the opioid epidemic or in our national parks. But just to create a place and a time where all Americans from every background uh, actually have to deal with each other. And there's less and less of that. Yes. Yes, sir. You ended your talk by talking about the inevitable civil war that would happen in South Africa. That didn't happen. Right. And yet you criticized Trump for bringing up the concept of why did we have to have this blasted, miserable, horrible American episode of the Civil War. You're not giving him the benefit of the doubt that the reason he's thinking in that direction is a kind of a reconciliation thought because his votes did come from the South mm -hmm. and that area, and he is a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I sense that. Uh, not, not really being fair on, on your part. Well, you're more generous than I am. I, <laughs> and I, I, re I respect that, sir, but I, I didn't, uh, it just seemed to me a, a completely incoherent statement. I mean, to say we don't know why there was a civil war, well, I think we do know why. And to speak of Jackson saying certain things about the civil war when he'd been dead for two decades almost, um, just made the whole statement seem uh, seem ridiculous. I I always feel that the president is lazy. You know that he doesn't, and that's a form of disrespect. Laziness. It wouldn't take much to read in for ten minutes to have a reasonable conversation with our most important ally in Europe, Angela Merkel. It wouldn't take much to read in a little bit on the history of the NATO alliance or on the history of the Civil War. But he's a man, I think, who believes that, um, and he's become President of the United States, so why wouldn't he believe it? Uh, um, who believes that he can always wing it. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. I don't see any sign of um, coherent strategy in his presidency so far. I don't know what he's trying to do in Syria. Um, relations with Russia are in this strange deep freeze where he can't do anything because he doesn't know how it will be seen, how it will be interpreted, given that there's now an investigation going on. Um, Gary Cohen, top economic guy at the White House, was asked in Brussels recently when he was there with the president what our policy toward Russia on sanctions is. This is five months into the presidency. And he said, we don't have a policy. And this drift, um, I think, is dangerous. I think it's dangerous in Syria. I think it's dangerous in Iran. I think it's dangerous in North Korea. Um, I think it could be dangerous in the Baltic states. Um, we'll see. Yes, ma'am. There's a lady at the, oh, sorry. Um, Maybe the lady at the back and then this gentleman. Uh, yeah. Do you think the entry to Omar today as it is was a deciding factor in some cases in the murder of Barack Obama? Um, everyone heard that, right? No, oh. um, the question was, do you think the country would be as polarized as it is if President Trump had not come right after um, Barack Obama's presidency. Well, I think, I think Barack Obama was a polarizing figure for many Americans who felt that he'd sold the country short, that he'd sold the country out. Um, some Americans didn't like the fact that there was a black man in the White House. Um, and the Republican Party, of course, took a very um, hostile approach to, to, to the Obama presidency. And, and Donald Trump, to give him credit, um, intuited 
the anger, which I think had many, many sources, um, a sense of the country being sold short, a sense of impunity, a sense that the system was rigged and rigged by the kinds of coastal uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, globalists like um, Barack Obama in these people's view. And uh, Donald Trump intuited that, Hillary Clinton did not, intuited the anger of, among uh, blue collar uh, white Americans who believe that white lives matter too. And he channeled that anger um, extremely skillfully. So yes, I think the alternation, um, the succession of Donald Trump to Barack Obama has helped, has, well, has contributed rather than helped, it's not a helpful situation, has contributed to this extreme polarization which has been building for a long time. It's been building and I see it continuing to build. I don't see any thaw in it whatsoever for now. Uh, there was this gentleman and then Uh, okay, this gentleman asked a question, if you could give him the mic. Sure. Uh, okay, well, and then you, yeah, yeah. But he asked the question, so maybe you could give him the mic. Okay, the question was, the question was, um, is there a realistic chance of impeachment? Um, I thought no, until the firing of Comey. Um, I think the firing of Comey was extremely rash. Um, and the reasons given for it, they've been, as so often with the president, there have been a succession of different reasons and they don't really make sense. Um, and I think now with um, the appointment of Mr. Mueller, uh, there, is, there is a chance. Um, uh, I don't know what percent I would put it at, but and I don't think it's it's certainly not imminent. But if if you found the Mueller inquiry ending in some form of indictment, and we have the midterms next year, um, let's see what's going to happen in the vote tonight. Um, and uh, you could imagine a situation where that report led to the beginning of impeachment proceedings, where of course. Uh, it's not a criminal activity that has to be proved. It is merely high crimes and misdemeanors. So, yes, sir, I think there is a chance. Um, I wouldn't put it above um, about 15%. Uh, just to continue on the, on the Trump business, uh, Sort of, I mean, maybe the, if you could try to speak of, up, sir, there's I a big, big feel room. There's a sort of a bait and switch situation there. I mean, uh, historically, whenever these kind of things happen, the left is usually much less effective than the right in mobilizing its, its forces. And one of the things that's happening, I mean, we can get into major problem if there's some major global mistake, but with paying all this attention to the president's peccadillos, what Congress is doing, what is happening in the courts, may have a much, much darker, longer effect than by us paying so much attention to Trump itself. That is what's happening with the health, uh, the, the health care bill, et cetera. I mean, uh, do you get that sense too that they're, they're basically, you know, this happened in Weimar where they said, well, we can control this guy and still get this guy and still get what we want. I think that there's some sense of that in, in certain areas of the right that they can control them and still pass their agenda that's going to be here for years. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, what, what the question is essentially what game is the Republican Party playing and what are they trying to get from the president? And I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. It's a high risk, it's a high risk game. I think Republicans. Um, believe that they can um, ride this crazy horse for, for a while and get um, tax reform, the, the tax reform that they want. I don't think pr the president knows what's in his health bill um, any more than he knew what was in, or still knows, what's in the Iranian 
uh, nuclear agreement that he has denounced as the worst agreement in history. I don't, I don't think he knows, and certainly to have a bill of that importance, uh, certainly to see an attempt to ram through a bill of that importance that will affect the lives of every American uh, without any debate, substantive debate of any kind, well, it's, it's, it's really extraordinary and it's, and it's very worrying. So, um, but I think that if that happens, um, Americans will take note, and I think American, uh, I think Repu the Republican Party will pay a price for that. Um, that's how democracy works. Well, you can get in touch with your representatives, no? I, th I think there are, I, well, buy a subscription to the New York Times, uh, <laughs> buy a subscription to the Washington Post, which is revived under Jeff Bezos of Amazon, uh, who will st soon own all of America. Um, <laughs> the books we read, <laughs> the food we eat. Um, um, Madam, I think there are, there are many avenues. There, there are demonstrations, there are... Um, I, I do think the press is very, very important right now. Well, then I would, I'm biased, but um, this, re this revival uh, of the press is something pretty extraordinary right now. And I confess I'm very proud of it. Uh, there, I think we should go over this side of the room. There, there are lots of people. Thank you. So, yeah, I, well, I respectfully disagree. I don't think we need utopian vision, certainly not of the communist and, and fascist kinds. Um, utopian visions make me feel very uneasy. Um, absolute truths, that kind of absolutism. Um, I saw it in the Balkans. I saw 100,000 100, people killed because of the absolute visions of people like Slobodan Milosevic and Franjo Tudjum. So I'm very, I'm very wary of that. And I, I do think that um, Isaiah Berlin's liberalism, um, it's dynamic, it's fluid. That's the beauty of it. It, it is capable of um, coming up with new ideas uh, for society. And certainly we need that. Um, our democracies have not been delivering this anger didn't come from nowhere. The impunity with which all the finances, all the bankers walked away from 2008, and similarly in Europe with the Euro crisis, the growing inequality, I think inequality and impunity uh, are very, very serious um, characteristics of our liberal Western societies in recent years that need uh, to be addressed. But I don't think the way to address them is to have um, some savior emerge. And I think um, the two concepts of liberty, um, liberty from and liberty to, negative and positive, uh, are both remain very important. I mean, the liberty to live our lives uh, free from uh, excessive interference and the liberty to discover in ourselves um, the self-mastery that can give coherence to a free life. So I, I don't equate Isaiah Berlin's liberalism or liberalism 
in general with a paucity of, of ideas. On the contrary, I think these are the kinds of societies, because they allow civilized disagreement, which to my mind is the mark of any healthy society, um, these are the kinds of societies that, at their best, are the most creative. And I would include, of course, the United States in that. I mean, this, what defines the United States? It's openness and churn. Uh, America without churn, without immigration, without renewal, uh, is not itself. That is not the American idea. And it's no coincidence that the companies that are changing the world and that are referenced by people all, of, all over the world, Apple, uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, Amazon, um, even poor Uber, uh, they, they're being born here. So, um, you know, we need, we don't need someone to tell us what to do or to come up with some extraordinary vision. We need the framework, at least in my view, uh, that makes those ideas possible. And for all their failings, I don't see any form of society that does that better uh, than liberal democracies. And I think Isaiah Berlin um, searched restlessly through his life for um, the formulations that would offer um, an understandable framework to, for that kind of society. Um, I think probably, well, one last question from you, Madam. In, yeah. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the very interesting, worthwhile talk, first of all. Um, you made the very important uh, point that no one likes to feel stupid, so that the liberal idea of re-educating people can lead to failure. So what would you suggest for us as individuals in um, speaking with people who are using what is called alternative facts, which are untruths? Mm. How, sh how can we... Um, <laughs> try to eliminate this polarization well, as individuals or th with groups. What is the approach we should use? Well, um, if I could frame this in negative terms as we're here in an Isaiah Berlin related talk, um, I mean, what is not helpful is contempt. Contempt is definitely unhelpful. And the assumption that because somebody believes something which may to us appear utterly strange, uh, the assumption that that person is necessarily less intelligent or less decent or less patriotic um, or less concerned about the state of America than we are. That assumption, I think, is unhelpful. I'm a journalist. Um, what do journalists do? They look, they observe, they try and understand what's going on. They listen, and they listen, I think good journalists at least, they listen through silence. They wait for people to reveal themselves. We're all encased in multiple layers of protection. It takes a long time to get less in war zones, but in general, it takes a long time to get to the heart of people. Um, but I do, think, I do think it's important. I'm not saying it's easy. I have no pat answer to your, to your question, but I think we have to be better listeners. We have to be patient. We have to banish contempt, and we have to try to engage and like that jury I spoke of or like any situation you've been in in your lives where you found yourself surrounded by people who were extremely different from you. Um, it's a question, it's a question of time. It's a, look, I mean, it, it's very difficult and as I said in my talk, um, listening is not acquiescence and can't be. Um, there are very grave things at stake here at the moment. Um, but I think, and I would include the press, my newspaper, other newspapers in this at times, I think on the whole there's been, um, or for at least for a period of time as Trump was rising, there was 
too much contempt and too little listening. Thanks. Isaiah Berlin would be proud of the discussion this evening. I thank you very, very much. And I invite everybody to a reception, have a glass of wine, we can continue the discussion. This series of lectures related to the exhibition continues in July. Uh, there will be more lectures. There are programs outside listing the next uh, speak, speeches in the series. We're opening an exhibition tomorrow evening. Please. Come frequently. Enjoy yourselves.